I love when Candace is in the front row. It's my favorite. Good morning, church. And man, it's been kind of a whirlwind. Usually it's until the sermon happens, and then I get to the last page of my notes, and I'm like, what just happened? I was only up here for 10 minutes. But this morning, this whole thing has just been a whirlwind, so I appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate all my family being here, my parents and siblings and grandparents and Allie's parents and uh, Isaac and Abby being here and just all of our friends and family. I appreciate that. Uh, I just want, can everybody just give my wife a round of applause for a minute? (laughs) Pastor Brad alluded to uh, having a baby any day now, and she's been working extremely hard the last several days to not have a baby before this happened. She loves me that much, so I appreciate that. All the late nights of uh, meetings and uh, just working with people and recording videos and staying up late to edit stuff, I appreciate you, babe. I, uh, this is all, this is all God, 100% of it. This this whole process of of being an intern, it was very strange to go to our parents. My uh, father in love is the lead pastor at Jonathan Creek. My dad's an associate pastor. My mom runs all the media stuff and was a treasurer for a long time. My sister helps with the media stuff. It's, I was a, a deacon there for a long time on the board and all kinds of stuff at a very young age. It was an extremely difficult decision to come to, to pull our family out of our church that I grew up in that I've been going to since the day that I was born. Uh, but to see God through, through it all from beginning to, to now, every step of the way, every morning and night that it was difficult, everything. I'm just so grateful for that. And I've been extremely blessed over my life to have people in my life that would speak life into me and speak life over me. Uh, this, this calling on my life to be now be a pastor, it's still kind of weird for me to say, but to, to have this role and this responsibility, I don't take it lightly. If anybody either was in Charleston a couple weeks ago or watched the message online where I preached about church clothes, I'm not changing just because I'm a pastor now, okay? I got a little more dressed up than usual and put my church clothes on because I take this very seriously and I want, I want to show that on the inside and on the outside, but next week I'll be back in my hoodies and t-shirts, so don't worry, nothing's changing there. But as I was getting ready for this message, God gave me the title, as I often say, he, he often leads with a title and kind of a concept that I just kind of think about and mull over and pray over for days and days and sometimes weeks, and as he gives me the scriptures and the body of the message to go with it, he gave me the title, You Just Haven't Seen It Yet. A song that, uh, by Danny Gokey that, that has that same title that, that uh, has been something, especially in the last season, that I've, been, I've listened to a lot and just kind of digested. And, and as I was thinking about this message, that you just haven't seen it yet, I was reminded in my, my own life of this process of of getting to where I am, in, and not just you know, in the church and in ministry, but in my career and my life and my family. Uh, from a young age, I was told, uh, you know, you're going to do great things for God. God wants to use you in a mighty way. He, wants, he has a calling and anointing on your life. And I, uh, I referenced it a few weeks ago, but a book by Craig Rochelle called The Christian Atheist, Believing in God but Living as if He Doesn't Exist. And that's what I was doing for most of my life. My, uh, my early life and in my teenage years and my early 20s, I believed, and I, that was that was what I portrayed. Like I talked about a couple weeks ago, I put my church clothes on and I, I played the part. I walked the walk and talked the talk, but you can do that. But if your heart is not in line with all of those things, it doesn't really mean much. And as God kind of reminded me of, of where I was and where he's taken me already and, and showing me where he wants to continue to take myself and my family, he took me to a scripture in John chapter 9 that he kind of paralleled that story that passage of scripture with my own life, and and there's some key things that I want to take out of that scripture. So we start in John 9, verses 1 through 12. It says, as he went along talking about Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, it only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. 
He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. And I found it very interesting at the beginning of this passage how the disciples, their first initial reaction to learning this man was born, from, born blind. In verse 2 it says, The disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man, this man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus says, Neither this man or his parents sinned. And Jesus said, but this, man, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And it reminded me so often in my own personal life and in the lives of all of us how often we like to play the blame game. Every time we see something, if somebody's going through a trial or, or somebody's struggling with something, in my own life, I, I've been guilty of this. It's really easy to see the addict and say, man, why don't they just stop? Why don't they just change? It's, I, don't, I don't do drugs. Why can't they not do drugs? But sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes it's not a person or a place or a thing that we can blame. Sometimes there's not an underlying root cause that we can dig all the way down to and find but God can. We can be so quick to pass judgment on all of those around us for a number of different things, but it's not, for, it's not our place. It's not something that we are to dig for. It's not something that we are to go and say, hey, why don't you try this? You should, you should really do this. This is what I did. Sometimes what it takes is Jesus Christ coming on the scene and spinning on the ground and making some mud and walking up to that person and healing them supernaturally. We can't do that. I do, as much as I would love to, I and myself do not have the power to lay my hand on anyone and heal you. But the Holy Spirit through me can. Jesus Christ working in your life can. But we can't find the answers in ourselves. We, we can't search and search through the world and other people, human beings, man-written books. We can only go to one book. We can only go to one place that was inspired by the Holy Spirit that we can go to and find the tools necessary to dig that deep and heal that wound. I've, I've told the story many times about our two-year-old Zeke a couple years ago whenever he was struggling with RSV, and I, I'm not going to go into the whole thing again. I've told it several times. But in that moment, it was really, really easy for me to question the doctors and the nurses, why weren't they doing this? Whose fault is it that he's getting worse? They said this would work, and it's not working. And in the, heart, in the most difficult week of my entire life, sitting there, watching at the time my three-month-old son just struggle to even breathe, just struggle to remain alive, in that moment, all I could do was blame other people. In that moment, the first thing that I could do is say, whose fault is this? Is this my fault? Did I take him somewhere where he got into contact with germs and got sick? Is this the doctor's fault because they didn't use the proper medication right away? Whose fault is this? Who is going to fix this problem? That is exactly where my mind went at first. But God was quick to remind me that sometimes it's not someone's fault. See, we live in a fallen and imperfect world, unfortunately. We live in a world that has nothing for us but pain and agony, depression and anxiety. That's all the world wants for us. That's all that the enemy wants for us in this world is to be down and out. That is right where he wants us, down, depressed, anxious, overthinking everything, angry at everybody else, blaming everybody else. That's exactly where he wants us every single day of our lives. Because if we stay there and we live there every single day, we will never be effective for Christ. But all while God was, all while this was happening with Zeke, God was working in the background. You see, this man in this story, I love this story in Scripture, this man had no idea what Jesus was doing. The whole time he was sitting there, he was blind from birth. He had known nothing but darkness his entire life. And so when this man approached him, he had no reason to believe that it was going to be any different day than what he had been living his entire life. The Bible doesn't say how old he is, but it says he was a man. So he was, he was older than most. All he had known was darkness. All he had known was despair. And so when Jesus Christ came up to him, he would expected nothing else. But as he was standing there and Christ saw that he was blind, the disciples were asking questions about it, questions that he's probably heard a million times. Whose fault is it? Why is this guy blind? Why was he born blind? And all he could do was just stand there and listen to him talk. But while everybody in the background was talking, Christ was working. The whole time, 
that he was sitting there thinking, man, this is just more people that are going to come and ask me questions about being blind that are going to point out the obvious that I can't see. He didn't even know. He didn't even see. He had not yet seen what Christ was doing in his life. And what Christ was doing was the one thing that would actually lead to his healing where he would have sight for the very first time. He was working in the background. He was working where the man couldn't see it. And I, think, I believe that it's more than just physical sight that this man couldn't see. He didn't pick up on this. There's a lot of times that, that God's doing something in our life and it's like, okay, God, this is kind of weird, but I think you're doing something here. He, he didn't have any of that. But Jesus was working nonetheless. Sometimes we have no idea what God is up to in our lives. I know I don't. I don't have all the answers. I can stand up here and pretend I do, but I don't. So many times in my life, things have happened, whether it was Zeke or whether it was other events in my life, and I'm like, what is going on, God? Why are you doing this? Why did you take this person away from me? I I had a relationship with this person. I was friends with this person. I had fun with this person. Why does my loved one have to be sick in the hospital? I don't understand. Why did you take my friend or my family member at such a young age? I don't get it. But be, do not be mistaken. God is working when you can't see it. And as I went through this, I started asking myself questions. And as he took me through this scripture, and I was trying to figure out, you know, what he was doing here time and time again, like I always do with, with messages or with my life. I was trying to figure out, okay, God, I, I understand the basis of this message that you're working when we can't see it, that you're always doing something, that, that as we're praying, as we're seeking your face, as we're being faithful to you, you are being faithful to us and working in our behalf. But then God showed me something else in the story that, that just kind of blew my mind. I haven't, had never thought of this story, this, this passage of Scripture this way before. And God asked me a question. He said, if you were this man and you knew what I was doing, if you knew that I was, that I was getting ready to heal you, But to do it, I was going to have to spit in the dirt and make mud and then rub it on your face. Would you let me? Because so oftentimes, God works. We always like to say God works in mysterious ways, and it's true. But I believe there's a reason for that. I believe there's a reason that God doesn't always do things the way that we want it done. Not only because he knows better than us, but sometimes if God said, hey, this is what I'm going to do, we wouldn't let him do it. If this man had seen him spit on the ground and start walking towards him, be like, hey, whoa, what are you doing? Right? You take a step back and say, you're not putting that on me. Can you just pray? Can you, can you just sprinkle some water on me or something? Like, there, There's got to be a different way, right? But this is how God wanted to work. This is how Jesus Christ wanted to work in his life. But there's so many times the things, people that he wants to remove from our lives, places that he wants to take us, moving towns, switching churches, a different calling on our life, a different place that God wants us in, if we see it ahead of time, we might not go through with it. We might hold God back from what he wants to do in our lives because he blessed us with free will to be able to make decisions for ourselves. But that doesn't mean he doesn't want to lead us. If this man had leprosy and, and wasn't blind and, God, and Jesus walked up to him and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spit on the ground here and I'm going to put this on your arms, I don't believe that he would have let him do it. And we're the same exact way in our lives. We, off, we often forget what Isaiah 55, 9 tells us. And there it says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And see, the opposite of this concept is also true. And God, as he continued to unravel this and peel back the layers one after another, and he took me through this and he reminded me that sometimes we would hold God back if we knew what he was doing because it's not our way. But the opposite is also true because I think, and I can say this for myself especially, that there are times in my life that if I would have seen Jesus spit on the ground and heal somebody, I would have been running around spitting on everything trying to figure out what magical solution to come up with to take care of my own problems. Let's be honest, if, if we saw that and we thought, that's all you got to do? Excuse me, Rabbi, you know, Pharisee, Sadducee, you know, Pastor, will you come over here? To, you know, you're, you're a holy person. You're called by God. Can you spit on the ground over here and put that on my eyes so I can see too? Or will you spit on the ground over here and rub it on my arms so that way my leprosy will be gone as well? Can I I do exactly what this couple did? This couple was, man, they got put through the ringer. Their marriage was about gone. They were getting torn apart. But they found a way to get back together. Let's go ask them, like, hey, we're going to do exactly what you did. It worked for you. It's going to work for me. But that's not always the case. 
You see, those people have people in their lives that the process that they needed to go through, the method in which God restored their relationship is going to reach other people that are in that same boat that they can go out to and then pour Christ into and vice versa. And it will continue to grow. But the people in your life that need you, the people in your life that need to hear your testimony, the the struggles that you've been through, the stories in your life that you've had to battle through and struggle through with God, they need to hear your story. God has you exactly where he wants you because he has a purpose and a plan for your life. God has you exactly where he wants you because he has his own method of healing for your life. He has his own method of restoration for your life. It's not going to look like the person sitting next to you. Your life, your struggles are not going to be the same as the person next to you. There's a 99% chance that the person sitting next to you right now does not struggle with the same sin that you struggle with. But the person on the other side of them might. The person sitting in front of you or behind you might. Don't hold God up because he's not doing things your way. Allow him to work in your life the way that he wants to work in your life so that way you can share that testimony, that you can share the power of Christ with other people that he will lead you to so that he can do the same in their lives. Psalm 55, 22 says this. It says, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. And then in Nahum 1, 7 This is how good the Word of God is. You don't hear Nahum preach too much. But the Word of God is alive and active, amen? All of Scripture is good for our teaching and our leading. And there it says, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. It doesn't just say, Cast a little bit of your anxiety on Him, or it doesn't say, Go to Him when you're really, really struggling. It says, cast all of your anxiety on him. Every bit of it. Cast all of your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Because he cares for the people sitting next to you. Because he cares for you so much that he would send his only son to die if it was just you. If it was just you. If you were the only person that needed saving, Jesus would have done the exact same thing 2,000 years ago. He would have marched right up to that cross and jumped right on it again and shed every drop of blood again for you. And then once you get it, now he did it for the next person. Once you understand that and you get that in your heart, you get that in your mind, and you believe it with every fiber of your being, now you get to take that good news to someone else. The Bible says, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. As soon as you get the love God part figured out, we got to start loving other people. We've got to start taking these times. We've got to let God work in our lives, no matter how mysterious a way it is or not. We've got to submit to him. We've got to let him work. We've got to let him move and create a personal testimony for us that we can share with other people. You see, the man in this story, the man in this story was blind from birth. I'm here to tell you this morning that the man in this story is you, church. The man in this story had something that he had struggled with his entire life. He had something that was holding him back. He had nothing to offer the world. This man had nothing to offer anyone else. We've got a lot of technology now that that can help uh, sight-impaired people or blind people do different things and, and accomplish different tasks. We've got all kinds of technology now, but they didn't have that back then. This man in the the eyes of the world was good for nothing. But God healed him anyways. God took this man that by the world's standards had nothing to offer. He took this man that by the world's standards might as well just sit there and beg for the rest of his life because that was as good as it was going to get for him. And that man is us today, church. When we come to the cross... But on our own, by ourselves, and we have that salvation moment, when we get there, we have nothing to offer Jesus. There is nothing that we could say or do. There is nothing that we could bring him that does anything for Christ other than a willing heart. There is nothing that we can do for this world apart from Jesus Christ. You can accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. You can make as much money as you want to make. You can own as much property as you want to own. And there's nothing wrong with that. I have goals like that too. I've got, I've got worldly goals myself. I really want to be successful. I really want to provide for my family. 
I, from a young age, I wanted to be a husband, I wanted to be a dad, and I wanted to work so that way my wife had the option of whether she needed to work or not. That was always my goal, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's my only goal, if that's my only purpose in life that I see for myself, I'm doing it wrong. There is so much more, and this man didn't even know it until Jesus healed him. But why did Jesus heal this man, this blind man that was good for nothing, that had nothing to offer the world but, but to just sit and beg? For that verse that we just read. Because he cares for you. Jesus healed this man not for anything that he could get out of him. Not for anything. He didn't heal this man even for this man. At the end of that story, as we read through it, what did he do? He went out and told people about it. He went out and said, I, I don't know what happened, but this man they called Jesus spit on my eyes and now I can see. He told me to go to this place and rinse my eyes and now I have sight for the first time in my entire life. He did it so the man could go out and he could tell people about it. God doesn't work in our lives. He doesn't, God doesn't heal us for us. God heals us so that we can bring glory to Him and we can bring honor to Him and then we can bring other hearts to Him. I, uh, I relate a lot with this guy in this, in this passage. When, a little over two years ago, whenever my family first came to Family Worship Center, we, uh, we had actually, a, a couple months before we started attending here, we had come to a concert uh, whenever Carrollton was here. And as we pulled in the parking lot, it was a very strange thing. My wife said, I feel like you should work here. And I just kind of laughed. I was like, that's funny. You know, I, I actually saw an application for an internship, you know, process here at this church that I almost applied for, but I decided not to. Her head whipped around real fast. She goes, huh? You didn't tell me that. But two years ago, even, even as God was drawing us here, he was, he was leading us here, I, I, this man resonates in my heart so much because at that moment, I saw myself as this blind man. I had nothing to offer. I had no formal training. I had never preached a message in my entire life. I had never counseled anybody. I had never edited a picture, let alone a video. I, don't, I knew how to hit record on my phone to record my kids in there being cute, and that was about it. I had nothing to offer whenever I first stepped foot on this property. There was nothing in Josh McLean that was special whenever I got here, aside from the Holy Spirit. I was blessed with godly parents growing up, and, and, and then whenever I, I first met Allie and started dating her, and, and her dad just immediately started speaking into my life as my parents had done all along. And so many people, but especially those, the, my family, my close family, told me, God has an anointing for your life. God has a calling on your life. God wants to use you if you let him. And even two years ago, whenever we pulled, walked in this door, these doors for the first time on Veterans Day 2018, it's an easy date to remember. That's the only way I do it because I forget a lot of stuff. But November 11, 2018, we walked in here for the first time not knowing what God wanted to do. At that time, I had been taking a few online courses, uh, Bible courses, but uh, much like my education at Lakeland College, it didn't really last a whole long time. You see, this man was blind. He had nothing to offer, and, and all I saw was myself coming on this property in full transparency, I walked in here thinking, I know God has a call for my life, but I'm just a college dropout. I say that and my parents always tell me, you didn't drop out, you know, you found something better. It's okay. I can admit it. I was a college dropout. And I used to say that, I used to hesitate to sh say that because I had so much shame in that that I had just quit on something. But I, even, especially as I prepared this message, but over the last couple years, God has reminded me that there's no shame in that because I dropped what the world wanted for me and I picked up what God wanted for me. I, uh, I remember very clearly a, a conversation that I had with my dad in 2011 that this opportunity had presented itself to start this apprenticeship program and I was going to Lakeland at the time, and I got a phone call that said, hey, do you want to go to work? I said, well, yeah. I don't really have a job right now. I'm just going to school. He said, well, if you start, you may have to postpone school for a little while because, you know, you're going to start in July, and it's probably going to last into the first semester. I was like, okay, well, I, I can take a semester off, I guess, and then get back to it. And then working until about September turned into working until about February, and so I was missing a second semester. And I remember having a conversation with my dad right before this, this apprenticeship thing really took off, and I said, I, I don't know what to do. Like, my whole life I've been told, you go to high school, you get good grades, so that we can go to college and get good grades, and you can get a degree and get a good job. And so as I was having a conversation with my dad, and I was telling him, like, I don't want to let you guys down. You know, like, 
you know, my whole life I've worked hard for this. You guys have come alongside me and helped me work hard in school so that way I can get to good places in my life. And I'll never forget the question that my dad asked me. He looked at me and he said, well, why do you go to college? I don't know, get a degree, get a good job, provide for my family. He said, so they're offering you the exact same thing with zero debt and they're going to pay you to do it. Yeah. What are you thinking about? (laughs) Why would you pass up on that? But see, just like the calling in my life, and even before that, but even before I even saw the calling in my life, my dad saw something that I hadn't seen yet. That God was moving me into places that he wanted to use in my life, not just to bless me, but to work through me. God has placed me in a place where I can provide for my family, but is also flexible enough that I have I've not had to miss doctor's appointments for my children. I've not had to miss the birth of any of my children. I've not had to, to miss any big events. That I can make up some time here and there, and I can come work, work at the church during the week for a few hours here and there in the afternoons. I hadn't seen that yet in 2011 when he was doing it, but in 2019 and 2020 when God was full-blown using me in those areas, he reminded me. Let me do my thing here. Let me work here. Let let me spit on the ground for just a second. I promise you it's not that gross. I promise you it doesn't look good and it doesn't make any sense into a a normal person. How How is mud going to heal your eyes and give you sight? But God can use some very strange things in our lives to work for our good and His glory. I did not see in 2011 where God was taking me. Almost 10 years ago, I had no idea what God was going to do in my life. And if back then you would have told me that this is where he was taking me, I would have laughed in your face. I would have laughed in your face. I told you I believed in God. I believed that I was saved, but I, I, had the, I believed in God, but I lacked the power thereof, as the Bible says. I had no relationship with him. I was living for me. And I'm sure we can all relate to that on some level at some point in our lives when we're living for us and not for God. But I'm here to tell you this morning that all it takes is for you to have one encounter, one moment with Jesus Christ when he spits on that ground and he goes, comes at you with that mud and you just open your arms and say, whatever you got to do, come on and do it. Whatever you want to do in my life, just come on and bring it on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yield myself to you. You work in my life. You lead in my life. There's, 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 two, there's two prayers that I have had in my life that I vividly remember. I remember the prayer where I accepted Christ as my Savior. And I remember the prayer in the Cross County Mall in the bathroom sitting on the floor whenever I was the, the most broken that I've ever been. A year ago to, on Tuesday will be one year from the first message that I was ever able to preach here at Family Worship Center. And I told that story about how I was just down and broken. And I was, I was sitting in that bathroom stall, sitting on the floor, just crying my eyes out. And that's the second prayer that I remember very vividly in my life whenever I finally came to a point where not only would I ask God to enter my heart, but I said, God, I cannot do this anymore. Spit on the ground if you want to spit on the ground. God, work in my life however you want to work in my life. Rub that mud all over me if I got to. I'll take a bath in that mud if I got to for you to work in my life and heal me and take me to the places that you want to take me. I'll do whatever it takes. I remember that, I remember that prayer very vividly, and I pray that if anyone here has not had that prayer in their life, Let's pray it together this morning. God's given me a little bit more and a couple more scriptures, but when we get to that point of the service, I want you guys to come up, and I want you to come find me, Pastor Brad. Pastor Brandon had to speed over to Charleston to give a message this morning. We've got elders, and we've got some God-fearing people in this church that will come up here and pray with you. If you've never had that moment in your life where you finally lift your hands and you yield your body and you yield your life, your heart and your soul and your spirit, and you say, God, take over and do with me what you please. You won't regret it, church. I can promise you that. Just because the things that happen in our lives go against what we want and what we think doesn't mean it's not God. I would have much preferred to go to college. I had a college that wanted me to come play baseball there that I just couldn't afford to go to, but I would have much preferred to go there and play college baseball and and make some new friends and have a good time. But if I had done that, I wouldn't be standing here this morning. If I had done that, that that opportunity, I truly believe that the moment where I had the decision to make, go to school or go into this apprenticeship, that that fork in the road in my life, I had the choice of let Jesus use that mud or turn around and walk away. I thank God every day that he led me to that healing moment in my life with Jesus Christ. 
just because, this is a, a saying that I use a lot that I really like, that, that God used on me first. There's a lot of this stuff that, that I know that, at least whenever I was growing up sitting in church, I, I would be listening to whoever was preaching, I'd think, well, then, you know, okay, you're just preaching at me now. Like, I get it. But I can promise you that I will, never, I will never type anything on these sheets of notes and I will never say anything that God has not told me first. It's, I've heard it here preached before, but God will always preach to me before he'll preach to you through me. Like, like my father in love said this morning, you've got to be able to follow before you can lead. And I, I will not come up here and say anything that God has not told me. I will not, I will not come up here and, and, and tell you to do anything that I am not willing to do or I have not done in my life. And I'm here to tell you this morning that the truth is not dependent on your belief in it to remain the truth. Not only the truth of God's word, but the truth of what he speaks over your life. The, the things that he wants to do in your life, the plans that he has for you, Pastor Brad shared a little bit ago, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. That is not dependent on you believing that to be true or not for it to be true. Jesus Christ wants to work in your life. He wants to come into your life and take you to places that you would never expect to be either, regardless of whether you believe it or not. Jesus wants to come into your life. He wants to heal you through any means necessary. He may take you to the bottom of the bottom, the lowest of lows. He may take you to the deepest, darkest pit you've ever experienced in your entire life if that's what it takes to get you to yield yourself to him. He will allow different things to come and go from your life. He will allow different people to come and go from your life, different relationships, different jobs, different homes, different blessings. He will do anything it takes to get his point across to you, even if it means spitting on the ground and rubbing dirt on your eyes to heal your sight. That is exactly what he'll do if that's what it takes. Hebrews 12, 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and, hinders and that sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Read, read that one more time. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Throw off everything that hinders. Everything that hinders you, that sin that so easily entangles, get rid of it. And if you can't, God will. If you allow him to do it, God will get rid of that just as easily as you can. If you can't bring yourself to walk away from that person, then you get down on your knees and say, and you pray, God, please take this person out of my life. I can't do it anymore. Say, God, take me wherever you got to take me to get me to the where you need me to be. Even if I've got to walk in, in a huge circle to get back there. Whenever we came here the first time when I saw that uh, ad for a, an internship here at this church, I ignored it because I let Satan talk me, in, talk me into believing that I wasn't good enough. Everything that I shared with you earlier, that I was a college dropout, that I didn't even finish an online Bible school course, that all these different things, all the failures that I've had in my life, the times that I lost my job and got laid off and didn't know how I was going to provide for my family. He whispered all of those things in my ear whenever I first heard about this place. But God, amen, brother. And if I would have listened to him the first time, we may have had this, this whole day whenever it, uh, pre-COVID whenever lots of people could be here. We could have had this day whenever my grandpa would have been here because he wasn't sick. We could have had this day months ago, maybe a year ago. And there are things in your life that God wants to do so badly, but you just won't get out of his way. You just won't let him put that mud on. You've seen him do it to other people. You've seen him do it, do it in other people's lives, but you're just not ready to, to let go of whatever it is that God's calling you to let go of. You're just not quite to that place yet where you're willing to leave those people behind or those friends behind, that place behind, that addiction behind. Let's be honest, that addiction makes us feel really good. There are times in our lives when we get to this place that we're just in such a dark place that the only thing that we want to do is run to the one thing that we know we need to stay away from. I have been there, church. I have been there, and I find myself there from time to time. I am not perfect. None of us are. There are weeks that I, will, that I get this message ready on Sunday morning because everything through my life I run to first whenever I'm trying to get something done, and I get distracted, and I let other things flood into my mind. We can be honest here. We can be real about it. But God. But God. 
See, marathons are really hard to run because when you take that first step, you can't see the finish line. This, this verse tells us to run with perseverance the race marked out for us, but it's really, really difficult to take that first step because we just can't see the end of it yet. It's really, really difficult to get out of debt because when you pay that first payment, that zero balance still isn't there. It's really, really difficult because you, you finally make that sacrifice. You say, okay, God, I'm going to get my finances ordered so I can bless you and I can bless others. And then you make that first payment and there's still $30,000 sitting there looking you in the face. I'm like, well, this is not going to work. It's not going to happen. But God. Kids don't usually see, and as you saw this morning, this is a truth from my own life. Kids don't usually see the benefit of obeying their parents the first time that they're told something. Sometimes they're just going to run around and get crackers. They've got their own thoughts, their own ideas, and mom and dad are nuts and they don't know what they're talking about. Sorry. But it's really hard to run a marathon because you can't see the end. And it's hard to get out of debt because you can't, you can't see that zero balance. And it's really hard to believe that this simple little pile of mud that you just made on the ground is really going to heal you. It's really hard to believe that simply leaving the church that you grew up in and stepping into another one is exactly what God wants you to do. It's really hard to believe that, that quitting college and dropping out and, and going on to something different, even though your whole life, that's all you've planned on doing is going to college. It's really hard to make that mindset change and move from what you thought you were supposed to do into what God wants you to do. So how do we get there? How do we get to the place where we really believe that mud is going to do something for us? How do we get to the place where we really trust God to the point that we're willing to let, lay down anything he wants us to lay down? Psalm 46.10 says this, it says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Exodus 14.14 14 says, The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. You need only to be still, church. We, we, always, we always look for this this magic formula in, in Scripture, and we go to these stories for inspiration, which is, which is okay. The Word is here to inspire us. The Word is here to lead us through our lives. But there's no magic formula today, church. There's, there's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can say other than be still and know that He is God. Be still and know that He is in control. Be still and know that no matter who sits in the White House, He sits on the throne. Be still and know that no matter what, what disease is going around the world causing a pandemic, He is the great physician. He is the healer. He is our provider. He is our Father. And He is a good, good Father. As we close this morning, I want to share one last verse with you guys. And I really want you to think about this. I really want you to meditate on this Scripture this morning. Make this Scripture your prayer this morning and going into your week. And as I said earlier, if there's people that need to come up and have that prayer this morning, people that want to come up and they just want to lift their hands, they want to surrender themselves to Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit lead their lives, please come up. But if you've already done that, if you're in a place in your life where you're comfortable with your salvation, where you're comfortable with your relationship with Christ, I want you to really think about the Scripture. And as people start to come forward, as people come up for prayer, whether it's for healing, deliverance, chains to be broken, restoration for themselves or their family member or the, a, a marriage or, or a relationship, or they come up for, for healing, for depression or anxiety, whatever it is, I want you to think about the Scripture. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says this, Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. The one who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble. Jesus didn't heal this man for his own good. He healed this man so he would go tell people about it. So that he could get the word out that Jesus Christ can heal you. That Jesus Christ can change your life. And that's exactly why God has moved in your life. And that's exactly why God has delivered you from addiction. That is exactly why God has restored your marriage. That is exactly why God has healed your physical body. That is exactly why God has called you into a relationship with Him. 
so that we ourselves can comfort those that are in any trouble. We all have a testimony, guys. I, I can stand up here and I can tell you story after story and testimony after testimony about my own life. Tyler can get up here and tell you the powerful testimony he shared about a year ago. Brother Josh Frederick can get up here and tell you this testimony he shared last February. We all have a testimony. And that testimony is not for us to, to just get up here for the glory of ourselves and share it and get an applause or post it on Facebook so that way people can like it and share it and get a bunch of views. We have our testimony so we can comfort others that are in the same discomfort that we were in. We have a testimony just like this man, like, like he went out into the world, he went out to his neighbors, his friends and family, and he rejoiced and he said, I can see this man named Jesus has healed me. He spit on the ground and made mud and rubbed it on my eyes and it makes no sense at all, but I can see. All I know is that I was blind and now I see. Yours may be all I know is that I was addicted to drugs and in jail, but now I see. Yours might be I was walking into the courtroom to file for a divorce, but now I see. Yours might be, my personal one is that I've had arthritis in my knees and my elbows and stuff since I was seven years old. And one day, I can promise you this, I will be able to come in here and tell you guys that I can see. Be there to comfort those in the same way that you were comforted by God. He wants to use you today, church. He wants you to use you. He wants to use you every single day of your life. You don't have to be up here and give a testimony during a baptism service to be used. You don't have to, you don't have to go and, and get a degree from a, a college in theology to be used. If that's what God is telling you to do, then absolutely do it. We need people in our lives. My, my father-in-law is one of the, the greatest biblical minds that I personally have ever met. He is, knows so much about the Bible. His knowledge of the Greek and the Hebrew and, and the deep meanings of things he can speak into my life and he can teach me things. But if God is calling you to come up here and pray for somebody and comfort them, you come up here and comfort them. If God is calling you to stop what you're doing in the store right before Christmas or Thanksgiving or New Year's or the 4th of July and pray with that person or pay for their groceries when their card keeps getting declined, you go comfort that person. And maybe, just maybe, one of these days, God will call you to spit on the ground and He's going to use you to heal somebody. My prayer, and this is one of the most random things that I've ever thought in my life, but my prayer is that one day, God will bring someone in here sitting in a wheelchair and He will get to use me to lay my hands on them and they'll walk again. God still does that, church. God is still the God of miracles, just like He was. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God can heal that person that comes in in the wheelchair. He can spit on the ground and heal that blind person. He can remove that cancer straight from your body. He can pull that ventilator tube right out of your throat and put breath back in your lungs. Jesus Christ can do anything as long as you're willing to let him put the mud on your eyes. As long as you open your heart, as long as you yield to him, and just be still. Just be still and know that He is God. Father, I thank You so much. Father, I just thank You for who You are, Lord. As we celebrate this Christmas season, Lord, we just thank You so much for coming humbly in a, in a manger, God, to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect, sinless life, God to take the beating and the lashes and the stripes on your body that will in turn heal us. Father, to hang on the cross and shed every drop of blood in your body to put that cr crown of thorns pushed into your scalp, Lord, to have that spear jabbed into your side and drop every ounce of blood in your body for me and for every person that's listening to this right now. But God, most of all, I thank you so much that you did not stay in that grave where they put you. Father, I thank you for rising in power and sitting at the right hand of the Father in a place that you can continue to heal. You can continue to minister. You can continue to break the chains of bondage, God. You can 
bring down the strongholds that we have in our lives. And you can raise us up and you can use us to lead others to the same place. Lord, I just ask that you would just speak into the hearts of everyone here, Lord, that you would remind each person to just be still and know that you are God, to know that you are in control. We thank you for everything, Lord. We know every good and perfect gift is from above, and we praise your name, Jesus, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen.